Hello and welcome. Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians both past and present of the lands on which we live and work. Tonight's webinar examines the question, how will I manage financially? The panel will discuss financial planning, debt counselling, budgeting, superannuation and insurance. In addition, information and strategies will be presented regarding how to cope with these challenges. Before we get started, I'd like to go through some housekeeping to make this event as seamless and interactive as possible. Firstly, if you wish to ask either the panel or myself a question throughout the webinar, please use the text chat facility which is located in the bottom left corner of your screen. You can also use this feature to post comments and technical questions or to just chat and share information between each other. To protect your privacy, you will not be able to see who has logged in tonight but in the chat boxes you will see a first name and the initial of your surname. And if you experience any difficulty hearing the sound throughout tonight's event, please feel free to listen via the telephone by dialing the 1800 number provided in the chat box and then enter the passcode provided. We will also be launching some interactive polls throughout tonight's event. These are anonymous, so please participate. And during the last 15 minutes of the webinar, we will answer some of your questions addressing the most commonly raised subjects. Also today's event will be recorded and everyone who registered will be sent a link to, to view a copy of the recording. If at any stage you need to speak to someone urgently, please do not hesitate to contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14. This support is available 24 hours per day, seven days a week. So let's get started. Firstly, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have Norlinda Hernandez, a cancer survivor, Kim Hobbs, who's a clinical social worker, Alka Bissin, a financial counsellor, and Joe Schultz, who's a financial planner. I'm Jill Mills, and Annie Miller, our manager of, a, of the practical support unit, will be monitoring the live chat tonight, so say hello to her in the chat box. So the issues we'll be covering tonight, so getting help to manage and cope with financial issues has been identified as an unmet need for many people affected by cancer. Financial distress and cost concerns relating to medical treatment are common issues that are experienced. Then there are the extra expenses and loss of income resulting from the ability to work during or after active cancer treatment which further negatively impacts financial distress and significantly affects quality of life and for some compliance with treatment. Tonight we will look at how the referral pathways operate to access financial assistance, what the difference is between financial counselling and financial planning, along with how you may be able to access benefits, insurance and superannuation to ease your financial stress. Over to you Norlinda if you'd like to tell us your story. Thank you Gio. I am Norlinda Hernandez and I was diagnosed with breast cancer in October of 2012. I have a left breast mastectomy in November of the same, of the same year and I then had four months of chemotherapy and have suffered a series of side effects with my heart and also diabetes. Radiotherapy was a difficult experience for me and I have developed lymphedema which I still struggle with. I felt loved because my husband and my children supported me all the way. They were always at my side during and after the horrible chemotherapy. I returned to work in July of last year, but struggled traveling to work on public transport. My employer had moved from Sydney CBD to Alexandria, near the airport in Sydney, and so I eventually had to resign from my job. I did not want to stop work as I enjoyed my job and I was not in a financial condition or position to stop working. My husband's income was not enough to pay all our expenses and obligations to the bank. My husband and I were supporting our three sons who were all living at home and studying at the same time. Two of my boys did not work part did work part-time and help out financially, but it did not solve our financial stress. The nurses at Royal North Shore Hospital always noticed my gloomy face 
and helped me to find solutions to my financial problems. They sent me to the hospital's social worker who referred me to ALCA at Cancer Council. Cancer Council has been my silent provider and helped me to negotiate my financial difficulties. They initially helped us with some of our utility bills and transport to treatment on a community bus when I was having a radiotherapy. ALCA also worked with me to analyze my financial expense, financial situation. She helped me reconstruct my family income and expenses. She talked to the bank on my behalf and negotiated that they stop accumulating interest on my loan for a period of time. Cancer Council has also provided advice to guide me back to workforce. They have helped me to face the challenges of life ahead. ALCA encouraged me to do some study. I enrolled in an accounting course, and by undertaking the study, I have regained my confidence once again. With the help of Cancer Council, I was able to diligently repay my obligation to creditors, and I have managed to control the financial stress, which almost a year ago, I was not all sure about. What's happened there? Have you finished? Sorry, no, Linda. Um, we'll just go back up. I've got the slides now, so that's good. And now I would like to introduce Kim Hobbs. Um, Kim, Kim sorry, is a clinical social worker at Westmead Hospital. Welcome, Kim. Good evening, everyone. Nice to uh, know that there are some people out there, even though I can't see you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how difficult it is really to, uh, uh, to confront financial stresses at the same time as you're confronting and trying to deal with treatment stresses. So at the beginning of the treatment, uh, you've heard you've got cancer, you've got to start on a very long treatment program as um, Nolinda talked to us, and your focus is on getting well. That's the first thing you're thinking about, surviving and getting better. There's a whole lot of information you have to absorb and as well as worrying about your survival, you might be thinking about the cost of the treatment. So there are actual costs, the things like medications, hospital stays, uh, parking, all of those things, but there are indirect costs as well, such as losing time from work, your transport and your accommodation. Often though, people tend not to ask about these things. You have to have the treatment, don't you? So really, what does the financial stuff matter? What, why, do, you know, why does it matter that you, that you might be out of pocket? And even if you are worried about that, you might think, gosh, I can't ask them about that. What will they think about me if I ask up front what this is going to cost? You can't buy health, good health, right? So before you know it, the costs are starting to mount. And, and soon you're starting to worry about your bills um, and you, your costs are spiralling upwards, but your income is spiralling downwards but you still keep your head in the sand and you keep your mouth shut because I've got to get on with this treatment and I can't ask now what happens if I can't afford it. Stay focused on the treatment you tell yourself. That's what matters the most. I'll sort out the finances later. But with financial commitments mounting and worrying about bills, and maybe you still have no income, maybe you have a reduced income, Maybe if you're a single person uh, before this happened or you were sharing a flat with friends, you might have had to become dependent again on parents or family members and it's a bit of a demoralising place to be. So you start to worry and you get an anxious about that and you might think, gosh, I don't know if I can get to the end of this treatment. You know, I wonder what would happen if I didn't continue. I've met people who've considered stopping treatment because of the financial stress that they're in. And sometimes that too adds to your symptom burden. So it makes the treatment more difficult to complete. You probably know this already, but anxiety can increase nausea, it can reduce your appetite, it can exacerbate fatigue, and it can impair your sleep. So stressing about your money problems may have a real impact on your physical and emotional well-being. It may make you feel worse than you already were. So what are the costs involved in undergoing cancer treatment? Well, they're many and varied. Some are quite subtle indirect costs, while others are more obvious. So there's obvious direct costs. 
There's gaps that many of you will experience uh, in paying for your medical consultations. There's hospital charges, medications, parking, wigs, prostheses. And then there's unpaid time off work. So you've exhausted your sick leave, you've exhausted your annual leave and you still need time off. How much longer are you going to need off? What about returning to work? Is part time an option? Reduced work hours of work places stress on your tightly managed budget and most families now depend on two regular incomes and sometimes some paid overtime as well. So if you're not able to do that and furthermore your carer may not be able to do it as well because they're having to uh, take more responsibility for minding children or for getting you to and from treatment or for helping you run the household, then your very finely tuned budget unravels fairly quickly. The, uh, the important but simple things like transport and parking, they mount, those sorts of costs mount up quickly. If you're coming from a regional area, you will have accommodation and additional travelling costs. And of course, if you're coming from a long way away, your time off work is likely to be longer as well. But what about some of the indirect costs, the ones that aren't so obvious to the people around you? What about your family and caregivers? Sometimes they're missing work too as they accompany you to and from treatment. Some of them may need to reduce their own work hours to accommodate your treatment commitments. And sometimes you might, might be paying more for things like childcare and for help at home because you've, you're too fatigued to manage the usual housework and domestic chores. So some of you will find that you're needing to think about whether you can access income support through Centrelink. And that may be a new and unpalatable experience for you. Understanding eligibility criteria is difficult for me. I've worked as a social worker for a very long time and I find it difficult to keep on top of what Centrelink is offering. So then if you finally work out what you might be entitled to claim, you have to wade through a mountain of paperwork. They, they seem to need to know things about you that you didn't even know about yourself. And you may feel like you're defeated before you start and think it's not worth it. And then there are the constantly changing rules about benefits entitlements. Sometimes you can just think, well, I'm not even going to bother with this. I would encourage you to persevere. If you are entitled to any benefits at all through Centrelink, even if it's a small part payment, this may result in you having access to a healthcare card and other concessional benefits. Sometimes if you're a parent of, of small dependent children and you're getting a family payment, your reduced income may allow you to get uh, an increased family tax payment. In terms of all of the uh, the different expenses that are mounting up, try to keep accurate records of all your out-of-pocket medical expenses and, and prescription costs. Make sure you know about and register for both the Medicare and pharmaceutical benefits safety nets. Then you can become entitled to more benefits when you reach, reach your threshold. Now again, this can seem like an overwhelmingly complicated task, so enlist the help of friends or family members to understand and negotiate your way through this. All of those people who say, what can we do to help? Get them to do something practical like that. It's not possible for me or anyone else to advise you individually about your eligibility. There really isn't any way to find out what you can get other than to put in an application. Forms can be downloaded online or visit your nearest Centrelink office and ask about your entitlements. And there'll be more of that a little bit later in this uh, webinar. But realistically, there are many people for whom Centrelink payments won't be an option. Maybe you have someone like a working partner who can financially support you. Maybe you have a little bit in savings. People in these categories you may feel like they're being further punished by, just by having cancer and not be eligible for any payments at all. There will be people who fall between the cracks and for whom the cancer treatment leaves them with significant financial hardship. Listen closely to the later speakers who may have some suggestions if you find yourself in that position. I can assure you that at your cancer centre you will not be the first person to voice a financial problem. It's important to speak up first if you're experiencing financial hardship. Financial problems are really common for people going through cancer treatment and yet most of us feel reluctant to admit that this is the case. Ask to see a social worker at your cancer centre or brave the Centrelink office. 
Sometimes there may be small grant, grants of money through various organisations and charities that may be available for some patients with particular types of cancer. I must add and emphasise that this is only a possibility, but your social worker will know if you are eligible for any such schemes. You will not be the first person to talk about a financial problem. Overcome your shame and embarrassment. Don't, try not to worry too much about being temporarily dependent on family and friends. Before you get into dire circumstances, put up your hand and say there's a problem. You, might, you don't want to be in the situation of having mounting credit card debt and threatening letters from creditors. But if you find yourself in that situation, then our later speakers can address some of the options there. Look closely at your superannuation and insurance policies. Speak to your bank or mortgage provider before you're having trouble making your payments. Speak to your employer. Are there special provisions within uh, any insurance schemes that they have? Ask directly, is there any form of financial assistance that may assist during my treatment? And finally from me, keep listening to hear about the specific services that may be able to help you if things are getting tough. Thank you, Kim. Very sound advice there. Alka Bisson, she is a financial counsellor working with the Cancer Council. So welcome Alka. Thanks Jill uh, and hi everybody. It's uh, really nice to be on webinar today. Um, at the onset I'd really like to uh, thank Kim for having enlisting all those issues with so much clarity and uh, with so much uh, specific information about how one may feel when it comes to talking about financial assistance or seeking help and what an important role it is or <clears throat> and what an important role it is going to play uh, in our lives. Uh, often a cancer diagnosis, as Kim said, can change the financial situation of an individual and their family. Just like she listed, there are increased out-of-pocket expenses which can be due to high, medic high medical costs, travel to treatment, gap fees for the specialists and many other things. This, when coupled with loss of income due to illness, resulting from incapacity to work or reduction in work hours, collectively can impact individual financial situations. In the given circumstances, there may be a need to manage and assess your finances. The first step in managing your finances is to assess your situation. And the best way to do that probably is to prepare a budget by enlisting your income sources and your expenses. Uh, it may sound difficult, but it may be a worthwhile exercise to perform. Uh, so let's just sit down with a financial planner or with a financial counselor and look at preparing a budget. Try and identify different, I think the slides moved, I'm just going back to the previous one. Try and identify all the different sources of income that may be available. Enlist the different forms of income that you can see, that you can access. Check your leave entitlements. Check if you are eligible for any Centrelink benefits. Have a quick look at your superannuation fund. See if there's any insurance available that you can access. Check whether you can access superannuation as of now in special circumstances. Look at all the possible rebates, concessions, etc., that may be available for you. And have a close look, prepare a list of all the different incomes, sources that you can, uh, that you can enlist. I can see that the slides have yeah, been moving. Someone, is someone moving the slides. Slide. You just want to go back. Yes, to the first slide, please. Okay. Sorry about this. We're back on the... Yeah. Okay. Once so you've listed... Now. Yeah, once you've, made, once you've got all the incomes listed, the income that you're receiving from probably some children who are working and contributing at home, from your partner, or any other source of income, please make a list of all of that. Apply for a no interest loan if required, and have all the income sources listed on one paper. Simultaneously, we need to understand what the expenses are. Yeah, and I think, yeah, we're having a problem shifting the slides. Uh, you want to go to the next slide? Next slide, please, yeah. Well, yeah, thank on. you. 
Thanks, Jill. Which You've side do you want to be understanding on? Understanding the expenses. Okay. Uh, just like we've enlisted all the income uh, sources, we need to identify our expenses. It's really important to categorize these expenses. Uh, let's uh, segregate the expenses as necessary and unnecessary expenses, as regular expenses, expenses that are just one-off. Make a list all of, of all of them. Be aware of what rebates and emergency assistance schemes you can access. This sort of information can be available either from your social workers, from financial counselors or financial planners. Look at the bills that are coming in regularly. Often they seem very daunting and overwhelming when there's a reduced source of income, but bills don't stop coming in. It is at this time that we can identify which are the regular bills, look up concessions, call up the service providers, you can set up payment plans for each of your regular utility bills. Most service providers uh, will offer this hardship assistance to you. All you need to do is probably give them a call and set up a payment plan for the same. When you've enlisted all your expenses, the next thing to do is to identify if you have any debts that are mounting. Identify the debts and prioritize them. Look look out for debts which are uh, which are uh, yeah which are going uh, which have a legal implication attached to them those are the debts that have to be addressed uh, immediately take legal advice for them uh, or meet a financial counselor and uh, the financial counselor will be able to guide you uh, on how to manage the debt the financial counselor will assist you or you can do it yourself you can apply for hardship variations on credit cards, on loans, and other debts that may be available uh, or that you may be having with creditors. You can request for debt release or other debt management solutions from creditors. Here again, you can make use of financial counseling services. A financial planner can help you with this, or you can do it yourself. Managing your income and expense statements and having an in-depth knowledge about each of these areas will really assist you and prevent you from getting into bad high interest debts and will assist in solving immediate problems. Let's now just move to the next slide. I know that yeah, I think we've moved. Yeah, sorry about that. I know it's really overwhelming and daunting to be preparing these lists of income and expense statements, etc. And it can be really, uh, yeah, it can be very daunting when you're going through the trauma of diagnosis, going through various uh, treatment cycles, etc. And it is during this per, uh, during this period that you can probably access financial counseling services. Financial counseling is a free community service which is provided by financial counselors working in not-for-profit organizations assisting people in financial hardship. So what does a financial counselor really do? So the role of the financial counselor <coughs> is, yeah, that's the next slide. Thank you very much, Jill. So the role of the financial counselor is largely to support your rights and dignities. So the financial counselor will affirm your rights and dignities. They will inform you and educate you about them. They will inform you about rights and responsibilities while using credit and other marketplace services and thereby empower you with this knowledge. The financial counselor will assess your financial situation, that is help you prepare your income and expense statements, prepare the budget, conduct a full assessment of your financial situation, including regular income, expenditure, assets, liabilities. They'll help you go through all of that and give you different options and suggestions as to how you can handle your current financial situation. They will also assist you by identifying options and by prioritizing your debts and managing the financial issues in a better fashion. The financial counselor will pay, play a very, very vital role in serving as an advocate and will negotiate on your behalf with creditors and debt collectors. So if you have given the, author, the authority to a financial counselor to act on your behalf or to act as a mediator or your negotiator with the creditors, 
then it's the financial counselor to whom the creditors will make all the calls the debt collectors will call the financial counselor and the financial counselor will negotiate on your behalf uh, and manage all your loans and debts for you they will also play a very vital uh, role in debt management which could also mean depending on your situation uh, it could also mean arranging for a debt waiver of a debt uh, solutions uh, something similar to probably settlements of debts with lump sum payments etc so you can leave all this stress and distress and to the financial counselor and together with your op with your uh, permission and with your decisions the financial counselor will act on your behalf and negotiate on your behalf with debt collectors as well as uh, creditors that may be uh, yeah that may be following up on different debts that are available or that you are facing or that require any sort of uh, uh, legal intervention etc the financial counselor will assist you with that they will make referrals to legal aid and to other agencies that will be able to support you during this time to the best of their capacity in dire circumstances if we are looking at a situation where we are considering bankruptcy then the financial counselor will provide comprehensive support and information they will make sure that you are aware of what impact the bankruptcy will have on you what are the uh, questions that are involved in filling the bankruptcy forms they will assist you and explain each bit of that to you so that you know of what you are getting into and you are able to uh, apply for any of these things with absolute knowledge and with confidence that you are taking the right decision uh, now on this slide we have some of the areas in which with which the financial counselor can assist you as you can see up there on the slide budgeting unpaid utility bills debt collectors fines and work development orders superannuation and insurance referral to any other service that the financial counselor feels may be required payday lenders tax office housing welfare rights central bank benefits credit cards personal loans mortgage bankruptcy and debt agreements thank you elka um go to the her first slide joe show hi joe hi everybody how are you all we're all good thank you good so everybody my name is Jo Scholes I'm a financial counsellor uh, sorry I'm not a counsellor I'm a financial planner actually um, I'm based on the central coast of New South Wales as a financial planner I've done quite a bit of pro bono work with the cancer council I really enjoy this part of my job as I have a particular set of skills that I've gained over the years with working both with Centrelink and now as a financial planner it's very rewarding yet humbling to be able to use these skills to help people out especially in times of illness and hardship when all seems insurmountable to people i love the few simple things that i can do easily um sets them on the right path and eases everybody's burdens so you could, do you want me to move this uh, joe you're good with the slides yeah yeah yep yeah, yep <laughs> financial planners can assist with the consolidation of super funds quite of us now these many uh, many of us these days have different funds scattered all over the place but instead of doing consolidation yourself which is easy enough and it's free it's sometimes better to enlist the help of a planner which you may have to pay a small fee for um if your work's not pro bono that they're doing with you the main reason for seeking help is sometimes that unknown to us we can have insurance attached to our super without really realizing it if we consolidate the super yourself you'll lose that insurance and if you suffer a form of cancer there's a fair chance you won't be able to apply for new insurance due to under underwriting exclusions so it's really important just to go and get the right information before you move anything we as planners can assist you with claiming and accessing any super insurance that you may be entitled to under the financial hardship or terminal illness if you do happen to receive a payout um of your super and insurance under terminal illness what's the best way to handle this money as usual it's a really large sum of money and can sometimes be daunting as what to do what do you need to do first what do you need to pay first 
And if there's any left over, what's the best thing to do with that? If after all your debts have been cleared, you, you know, you might want to set some aside for your kids. You might want to put them into into trust. You know, there's all sorts of things that um, that people come across that have had, you know, have been through this. These, along with budgeting, um, after the after um, you've had the payout, are really good steps that you can go through with a planner. Making your way through the myriad of Centrelink payments and types of what you might be entitled to can be a minefield of stress and, and confusion. And often you'll be left feeling stressed, confused and worthless. So having a planner who knows what you may be entitled to and how is the best way to apply for these entitlements and they can guide you and support you through this time is very important and can be invaluable in this time of need. So accessing Centrelink payments, um, we can help you with the income and assets test. We can see if you're in, actually entitled to a payment. What payment type should I be applying for? And will your partner be entitled to a payment as well? What if I receive a payout from work or super? How will this affect me? What if I'm on compensation or income protection? Can I still get a payment? And will there be a healthcare card with it? So all really, really important questions and really important that you talk to somebody who knows and especially talk to somebody who knows before you even approach Centrelink. It's always one of our golden rules that we use here. This is, so there's three main types of payment um, that could be assist, assistance to people in need, um, especially you know, facing the time of, of cancer. Disability support payment, it's an income and asset tested payment. This payment would be for the actual cancer sufferer. If you have a form of cancer that would affect you ever being able to return to work, this would be a payment type that you would apply for. It's a very difficult payment that, to get granted due to having to be able to meet not only the medical requirements but also the returning to work test. Um, and you also need to take in, keep in mind with a lot of these payments that they can take months to go through um, and to get granted. Sometimes Centrelink will offer you a new start allowance with no looking for work requirement while you're waiting um, for the DSP payment to be granted. Um, so it's yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely like I said, it's a very difficult payment to get. Um, but sadly, there is a way to get it very quickly. The other way DSP can be granted, of course, is under what we term and what they term as a manifest grant. So sadly, if it's a manifest grant, this way is due to terminal illness within 12 months. DSP, DSP or disability support payment that's paid this way is usually granted very quickly. So um, when they get manifest grant claims go through, they do usually process them within a matter of weeks. So both of the DSP types of claims require medical reports from doctors and specialists of course. Um, then for the people who might be supporting you and caring for you, um, there's the carer's payments. Um, the carer payment itself is income and asset tested and then there's a carer allowance which is not income and asset affected. So both of these payments depend on the amount of personal care that you may need um, or that you are providing so to someone. Personal care means care for at least eight hours a day. This doesn't mean just doing shopping, driving, doctor's appointments, the general, general household help. It actually means personal care. Personal care is having to help someone shower, getting them in and out of bed, getting them dressed, help with personal grooming, taking medication, eating food, etc. So as you can see, the definition of a carer is a full-time job and essentially that's what the payment's for. On these screens, on these slides, you'll actually see um, some definitions about accessing your superannuation. So there's a few different claim types here. If you're aged under 55 years and 39 weeks, the one of the only ways you can really meet release of superannuation is if you've been on the income support payment for 26 weeks. Now the income support payment types are also restricted. If you're actually on a study payment, you won't be granted. They won't give you the release of superannuation. So it's really only for if you're on disability, if you're on carers, if you're on new start and those kinds of payments. The claim, the second the claim type of course is aged over 55 and 39 weeks. Now this is only for people who were born before the 1st of July 1964. Um, the reason for that is because of the rising age for, um, for retirement. So um, if you're born after 64, 
the release at 55 years and 39 weeks is a lot more difficult. You, and again, um, if you're in receipt of a Commonwealth income support payment, and it, again, it has to be for no less than 39 cumulative weeks since turning age 55. Home type three, again, is um, the one that we all don't want to really think about or have to, to look at, but sadly it is a, a part of what we have to do. So claim type three, of course, is a terminal illness payment. With that, you'll be required to provide, again, two medical reports. One of those is usually from general practitioner and the other one is from your specialist. Um, and with claim type three, you will be able to access all of your insurance if you have any death cover and um, all of your superannuation. With claim type one and two, the maximum that can be released um, is $10,000 and the minimum is $1,000. Um, this is up to the insurance um, and superannuation fund. So they're things that you'll have to um, you know, go through step by step um, as you're approaching that. Again, as I mentioned before, accessing your superannuation, these are the eligibility um, payment types. So disability, wife or carer, pension, sole parent. So they're all, the top ones are all the eligible social security payment types. And the bottom three are not eligible. So if you're on family payments, family tax benefit, part A and B, Oz study, AB study, or other use allowances or mobility allowance, these payment types aren't able to um, to access super under, under hardship. So um, definitely something that, as you can see, is a bit of a minefield. And go straight to the source first. Go and get professional advice and it can save you a lot of heartache in the end because we've been through cases with people where you know, they thought it was very easy to access super under hardship and things like that and it's not. So um, please go and, and seek um, professional advice on that. Question time now, I believe. Whoops. So um, we've, we had quite a few questions. Um, so the first question we've got there, we'll, I'll read it out. Um, and I think Joe was going to maybe answer it. Um, having had a cancer diagnosis, what are the implications for getting insurance? What needs to be considered before applying, e.g. length of time since diagnosis? Is that one you're happy to tackle, Joe? Or Yeah, yep, more than happy. Um, unfortunately, if it's a reputable insurance company that you're looking to and the cancer diagnosis has been a severe type of cancer, getting insurance again is probably going to be very, very difficult if at all. When you go through the underwriting process, it's um, very stringent. Um, you know, they look at, at your, your blood test history, your physical history, your health history, all that type of thing. There might be a lot of, um, play, you know, a lot of ones on TV and things like that that say to you, Oh yes, you know, we only have to answer. You only have to answer four medical questions, and we'll grant your insurance. The problem is, when it comes time to be paid, it um, it's usually not very reliable, and it can be a waste of your money. So the sad thing is, once you've had a cancer diagnosis, you possibly and probably won't get insurance again. So to me, this is a, a very important time. If if you're suffering cancer or you've got someone suffering cancer, um, it's really kind of a bit of a I suppose an eye opener for everybody. You really need to talk to all your friends and family, and really make sure that people have got their their insurances in order before you ever need it, um, because it's a sad fact of life that you know, at quite a few of us, and I'm going through this personally myself with my best friend at the moment. Um, she's now having to rely on on drawing her superannuation and life insurance under terminal illness. So please, if you've got friends and family, or you're going through this yourself. Um, just you know, make sure everybody goes and just checks what they've got, and make sure you've got enough to at least um, pay off your debts and keep yourself comfortable. Thank you, Joe. Um, so the next question, and it's an issue obviously when you're self-employed. Um, so I'll read the question out: Is financial assistance available for cancer patients if they are self-employed and unable to continue to work during treatment? So who would like to? Um, tackle that question. I could start with that and maybe Joe can come in. Um, it, look, it is more difficult but it's not impossible. So uh, I think both Joe and I have made it fairly 
clear that uh, dealing with Centrelink is a bit of a minefield, but persevere. It's, it's a matter of proving income over a period of weeks. So you're quite likely to have had reduced income uh, while you're having cancer treatment if you're self-employed. And so if you can produce documents that, that demonstrate that, then the usual means and assets tests apply. So it is more difficult but worth trying. The other thing is to think a little bit laterally and, uh, and hopefully when you set up your own business you looked at things like insurance and income protection policies and so on. If you have those, these would be the time to start looking at them and, and reading the fine print. And if you're someone who uh, has dependent children and you're getting a family tax payment, uh, then it, you might be eligible to look for a little bit more. Or if you weren't getting a family tax payment because your income was too high before you got your cancer, then your reduced income may help you to qualify for some payments that way. Do you want to add to that, Joe? No, I totally agree. Um, Yes, so um, if you are self-employed and you can prove that you've been self-employed via tax returns and things like that, um, Semlink will probably ask you for the two prior years um, full tax returns for your business and um, hopefully if, if you know all that's in order then you'll be able to access at least some sickness benefits if not some new start or something like that um, with a, instead of having to look for work again, um, they usually set it up as a, you get an exclusion um, due to medical um, reasons. So yeah, definitely, definitely um, talk to them. And Jo, I don't know if you saw raise um, the question we talked about insurance just previously, asking are we talking about life insurance and anyone can get health insurance. So can you address that please? Um, yes, yes. So um, I am talking about life insurance. So of course, yes, anybody can get health insurance. Um, but life insurance itself, once you've been um, ill with a cancer diagnosis, um, even severe health diagnosis, even heart, stroke, all those kinds of things, it makes it very, very difficult then to, uh, to get any kind of, um, as I mentioned, any time, but type of reputable insurance. Thank you, Jo. And just, if I can add to that on health insurance, just Again, be very careful reading the fine print about a pre-existing condition and, and the waiting periods for eligibility for payments um, and travel insurance is a bit of a minefield of its own. Thanks, Kim. Um, so the next question, uh, any discounts or schemes to take advantage of given this terrible diagnosis? So we covered that a little bit talking, I guess, about the healthcare card, but Alka might have a bit more to say regarding this question. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, so I'd like to again uh, stress on the fact that uh, there is emergency short time uh, discounts and schemes that will be available. So you could like uh, contact your service providers, get rebates, concessions on your utility bills, etc. But they are going to be uh, short term assistance and they will help you probably one time or maybe two or three other times if you've managed to get uh, different resources contributing towards uh, discounts and schemes. However, the key thing here is probably to look after uh, immediate financial short-term crisis and use the discounts and schemes for that. But uh, in the larger picture, it would be, it is really important to do the budgeting, set up uh, uh, payment plans and uh, get linked into a system of that type rather than depending on discounts and schemes only. Thank you, Elka. And um, do remember to, uh, to look into your Medicare and pharmaceutical benefits safety nets. It's uh, difficult to uh, talk to your pharmacist and try always to go to the same pharmacist uh, to access that scheme and, uh, and register with Medicare to make sure because when you reach a certain, a certain threshold, which is different according to whether you're a single person or in a family, uh, you will then get more benefits back from, from payments. We've got another question in the chat box. Um, question from Say in ACT, just asking about is there a free financial counsellor planner that they can access in that um, state? So, Alka. So, financial counselling service is offered free nationally. Uh, there's a slide at the end of the webinar which will give you uh, a link. Uh, 
to get access to financial counselors in your locality. So either you can type in your postcode and get free financial counseling service information, or there's a phone call or a telephone number which you can call up and ask them to connect you to a local uh, financial counselor that is available. And whereas financial planning services uh, are available, it may be worthwhile uh, calling up Cancer Council uh, on 131120 and they will be able to provide you appropriate information about the same. Thank you, Alka. Um, so we'll move on to our next question. Um, my husband is in full-time employment, so as I understand it, I cannot get Centrelink benefits while I'm not working. Are there any benefits available to me I am not aware of? And I'm guessing this probably is a Joe question. Um, it depends on the income that um, a husband's earning. For carer payment and disability support payment, as a couple, the cutoff is about 72,000 now. So if you're on what we call, I suppose, an average income of 50 or 60,000, even though the husband's working full time, depending on what other um, assets and things they have and, and money they have in the bank, they may be able to access a small um, amount of payment. If they can access a small amount of payment, then this will give them access to a, to a healthcare card, which sometimes is more important to people than the actual money um, because it, you know, it alleviates chemist bills and, and doctor bills and things like that. So um, yeah, so it just depends on what full-time employment covers um, as far as um, cost. Any, any other available payments, um, benefits? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, Centrelink, uh, you know, as we all know, is the main um, provider of payment services. So really it would be just, um, if you were in dire straits and really needed some help, it would be of course going to financial counselling and um, maybe accessing some of the other services like Salvation Army and, and places like that, which again, um, the financial counsellor would be able to put you in connection with. Thank you, Jo. And if I could add again, I know I'm like a broken record here, but um, if your income is reduced, so you, you've lost one income and you're down to one, uh, and you do have dependent children, think about uh, or apply for to see whether you can get family tax payment if you weren't getting it previously, or get a higher rate if you were getting a part payment before. Thanks. Yes, and it, actually too, if you can access some family tax benefit and you happen to be renting, mm -hmm. um, once you access the family tax benefit, then you would be able to get some rent assistance as well, which may be of help as well. And it may impact on uh, reducing your childcare costs as well. So yes, <laughs> those who have children. Okay, thank you. Um, again, in the chat box, we've got a, um, a message from Andrea. Now she has had cancer three times, and um, is saying my super fund offers offers a payment for health. Although I don't think I'll be able to access that. I think is what she's saying is I've had cancer three times. Is this for all super funds? So, um, who's the super expert, <laughs> Joe? We keep going to you, Joe. <laughs> um, does that make sense? Can you see that question? It does. There? It does. It, it depends on the super fund itself. Um, depends if you have accessed it before. If you haven't accessed it before, then I would definitely apply. Um, some super funds with the insurance offer like a re reinstatement benefit. So if you've had you know, some part of it paid out once before or you've accessed maybe the income protection or something like that, um, a lot of the time um, the reinstatement will kick in and you'll, you'll actually go back to, you know, it'll go back to what it was before. It, it's really something that you need to have someone have a look at for you. It's, it's, um, there's too many super funds out there and too many different kinds of insurances just to be, you know, to be general about it. I would definitely um, ask about it and definitely have someone help you about it. Thank you, Jo. I hope that's answered her question. Um, so the next on our list of questions is links for services as we're placed in rural centre Tamworth. And I think again, Alka sort of answered this question. We've got a link coming up in a reference um, slide. Um, that again, if you go um, to that website, you will be able to find services in your local area and also ringing the helpline, the 13 11 20 number. Um, you can also get information. Is that about right, Alka? Yes, for that absolutely. One? Yeah. And then the next one, how to manage bills whilst on a low income. And I think maybe Alka might like to talk to yeah, that so question. This, 
Yeah, it is something that I've addressed in my presentation again. Uh, the key thing here is to, uh, I'm actually repeating myself, is to have an access to the rebates and the concessions that are available and take that time out, call up your service providers, explain the situation to them, and they all have hardship assistance schemes in place. Set up a payment plan so that you have small amounts uh, of money being taken off on a regular basis from your income rather than being intimidated with quarterly bills which can be very overwhelming when they come at one time especially when income is really low so the key thing is uh, to set up payment plans because that's one of the best ways to manage your bills informing the service provider about your situation also makes it easier because they are compassionate and they are aware of your situation and they will assist you to manage your bills better. Thank you, Alka. Um, and again, in the chat box, I've got a question from John and Kim's actually replied in the chat box. Um, so Kim's, uh, John's question was in general um, suggestions for assistance initiated by the individual or instigated by your healthcare team. And Kim's answered that um, she suggests that you contact your healthcare team. And would you like to talk about that a bit more? Yeah, I'll just elaborate on that. Um, it's not possible to know when people are having uh, financial problems. And as I said in my presentation, please speak up about it uh, because we can probably point you in the right direction. You almost certainly have a social worker in your uh, health team. You may not know who that person is, so, so ask, uh, ask them, ask to be referred, and, uh, and they can help with that or, and direct you to people like a financial counsellor or a financial planner as well. Thank you, Kim. Um, so I think that's all the questions for now. We have got about four minutes left, so if anybody's got a burning question they'd like to ask, please type it in the chat box and um, we'll try and address it. So now we'll just uh, move on to a little bit of a summary. Um, whoops, go back up to the summary. So I guess summarising what we've talked about in a in a nutshell, obviously it's a huge issue. Um, if you are experiencing financial problems following a cancer diagnosis, as Kim said, it is a very common um, problem. So speak up and you know find out who the social worker is, where you're getting treatment, and um, and talk to them. Um, the fact that emergency financial assistance may be available to help you is there. Financial counselling is there to help you relieve your financial stress and financial planning, planning can help you to plan your finances. So all those sort of I think summar, summarise up. We do have a question from Carolyn saying, do you need to advise your super insurer that you have had a cancer diagnosis? So I guess Joe, I guess it depends at what stage, doesn't it? It does, it does depend on what stage. It depends on the seriousness of your cancer diagnosis. Um, I'll use my girlfriend for an example again. Um, she was actually, diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago. At that point in time, she didn't need to access her um, superannuation or life insurance. That situation has now changed. So two years ago, we didn't notify her insurer. There is a question on the form um, when you, you know, if it is, gets to the point where you do need to claim, have you been diagnosed um, with the same illness before, or same cancer before? Usually if it's a, a a, I suppose a secondary one, then the answer of course is no because it's secondary. So it's, it's a bit tricky again, but um, if it's something you don't need to claim at the moment, then no, I don't think you need to notify them, if that helps at all. Okay. Hopefully it does. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now the, the financial counselling services we were mentioning earlier, um, there's a, a credit and debt hotline you can call, um, the 1800 007007 number, Monday to Friday, 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, and then there's the Financial Counselors Association of New South Wales. Um, I'm presuming there are other um, associations in other states as well, Elka? Yeah, yeah. and uh, so if you see the last link of financialcounselingaustralia.org.au, uh, you can get uh, information regarding financial counsellors nationally on that site. 
all you need to do is just put in the postcode of the area that you live in and it will give you information regarding uh, local uh, free financial counseling services that may be available. So as I said once again, you know, this webinar is being recorded. You'll get a link emailed to you so you can go back and look at these numbers and um, the links to the website. So just because we're finishing in one minute doesn't mean to say you haven't got this information if you haven't managed to write it down. So it takes a couple of days but um, we will get it to you. So then the last um, slide here is our helpline which is now known as Cancer Information and Support 13 11 20 which is a national number so no matter what state you're in you can call that number um, to get advice. Um, if you want to find out more about financial assistance and services, certainly call the number and they'll be able to point you in the right direction um, Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and um, we've also got another link there and again if anything's come up for you tonight you can call Lifeline, you can talk to them 24 7, 13, 11, 14. So we have a, an exit survey so don't all run away, um, we'd love you to do the survey so we can get some feedback from you help us plan for our future webinars and provide information um, that's going to be helpful for you. So thank you very much and thank you to Joe, Norlinda, Kim and Alka for coming along tonight and providing all this great information. So thank you very much. <laughs>